Okay, so um, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so thank you for tuning in to the, another Risk Institute online session. So today uh, we're fortunate to have with us uh, Mr. David Ropeg, uh, who will give us a talk. Uh, risk communication is not just about the fact. And so the presentation will be around 45 minutes as usual, followed by a 15 minute of Q&A session. And so please uh, could you make sure your microphones are muted. And if you'd like to leave uh, any questions in the chat, so please uh, feel, feel free to do so. And so before we uh, begin, I'd like to make uh, just a few announcements. So uh, uh, with the summer holidays for most academics, uh, we're going to spend the uh, next month organizing and improving events for the upcoming academic year. Uh, so the next talk scheduled is uh, with uh, Dr. Beth uh, Montagu he Helen from uh, University of Nottingham on the 6th of uh, September, 2 p.m. And followed by uh, Mr. Silvio uh, Pantovic, Pantovic uh, talk on the 20th of September, 2 p.m. Um, so let me uh, give you some introduction uh, for um, uh, today's speaker, Mr. David Ropig. So he is a retired Harvard University instructor, author and international uh, consultant and speaker on uh, risk perception, risk communication and risk management. He was an instructor of risk communication at the Harvard School of Public Health and was coordinator and principal faculty member of the school's professional education course, the Risk Communication Challenge. He taught the course critical thinking about environmental issues in Harvard School of uh, Continuing Education from 2006 and 2016. And he has written more than 50 articles, uh, book chapters and other essays on risk perception and risk communication in both the peer-reviewed academic literature and the general, uh, general media. So David, now uh, the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, I'm all set. Hello everybody, thank you for being here as opposed to outdoors watching the sunspots and the 88 degrees in Liverpool. And I'm sorry that um, back in the old days we used to do this in person and being a Liverpool fan myself, I have enjoyed coming by, but oh well, next time, whatever. Um, let me um, continue to do that. Um, I'm really looking forward to this because, especially in this intimate place where we can have good conversation, um, for the following reason. I'm not an academic, I never was. I spent the first part of my career as a television reporter, a broadcast journalist on the streets of Boston. And what got me interested in this risk business was, um, I started to specialize in science and environmental stories, and I found a, a pattern, even in non-environmental stories, crime stories, whatnot. People were more afraid of some risks than the experts said they needed to be, and they were less afraid of some risks than the experts said they ought to be. And this pattern, it, it didn't matter what the risk was, crime, drunk driving, airbags, killing children in the early 2000s, silicone and breast implants, um, chemicals and nuclear power and a lot of environmental issues. The same thing would happen. So it piqued my curiosity enough so that back in the day when you had to go to the library, remember those days? Uh, I went to the library and looked up whether the psychology of risk perception had been studied and indeed it had. And I started doing stories or, or telling the risk perception aspect of the stories I was telling on TV, I would highlight, and these people are afraid because they don't have control, or these people are more afraid because we're generally more afraid of risks that are man-made than natural, human-made, excuse me, than natural. So when television news got to be kind of pretty shallow and I was trying to be a serious journalist, I switched to the Harvard Center for Risk Analysis, then uh, just kind of living out its notorious days as having accepted corporate money and oh my God. At that point, it was 31 of 32 
projects funded by the federal government, but it had started with uh, corporate money and um, under John Graham, um, a, a, a premier academic who took a very um, quantitative view of risk. Um, unless you can prove it to me, it's not really a risk. Um, that sort of position. And I was their PR guy. Um, my job was to get their name more out there so that they could raise more money and endow the place. That was my job. But I had, I had done stories about this risk perception stuff and I noticed that the center was studying risk quantitatively, right? The numbers and on a big policy level as was appropriate for what the center was about. And they were medical as well as environmental. There were a lot of four of the six faculty, I think were working on um, qualities and cost benefit analysis and cost effectiveness analysis, methodologies, sorts of things. And I said to them, well, gee, guys, out there in the real world where I come from, that's not how people see risk. And they said, yeah, we, we know there's this body of literature on Paul Slovic and Baruch Fischoff. And, and I said, yeah, and maybe you ought to incorporate that into your studies because how people behave determines the efficacy of your policies. Uh, it was a little bold for a non-scholar to suggest what scholars ought to be doing and that led to some friction, but that story aside, um, they said, yeah, I think you're right. And uh, that grew into me teaching it and teaching it in an applied way, which was risk communication. And that's what my talk's gonna be about. Not talk, conversation with you is gonna be about. And so I wanna start with this. So uh, Scott and V-Step and Canal and whoever was there and Curry, your, your backgrounds are in, as I understand it, risk analysis mostly, is that fair, accurate? Well, I, I'm not a risk uh, analysis, uh, but Scott's- um, Yeah, uh, I, I, I think that's true, yeah. They're... Okay, okay. So, okay. so the reason I draw that distinction is, um, there are different definitions of what risk means. It's a very slippery idea. Uh, for risk analysts, there's this definition that I put up there, which is, you know, you can change the words a little bit, but it's a, a quantifiable beast. And toxicologists get even more narrow, you know, hazard times exposure. Um, but for regular people, if you look it up at the dictionary, the general definition is it's the chance of something bad happening. Now, what's interesting about that definition, and it's what I've spent years trying to communicate what I think is the importance of, is that there are two parts of it. There's the chance part, and that's what risk analysis does. It tries to quantify that probability and severity. Yeah, and toxicologists, certainly the chance of, you know, one in a million parts or one in a thousand parts do the trick can become toxic and hazardous. But the bad in the common definition is inescapably subjective, not subject to quantification. So when we say the word risk, it sets off all sorts of different meanings in different heads. And from my perspective, it always was super important to incorporate the regular people definition in the risk communication approach. Because when you're doing risk communication, whether it's as risk management, you're trying to counter anti-vaccine communication, you're trying to get people to uh, consider an unwanted facility in their neighborhood, whatever, you're talking to mostly regular people. You're not talking to risk analysts, and you're certainly not talking to people who are purely rational. As I will get into in the rest of my talk, most of us, including those of us in, in this conversation, are never purely just the facts, objective, rational. So that's where I wanted to start. So let me go over here and change it. So that led 
to the development over time in my mind as I read about risk communication. I didn't know about it when I got to Harvard. I studied up on it and I read a lot of the critical um, literature and, and a lot of the uh, called a lot of the practitioners, um, Peter Sandman and Vince Cavello and, and the people in academia. Uh, I know Ragnar Lofstedt at King's College was cited in one of your earlier talks. He and I crossed paths. Um, as I learned about it, it struck me that there was no active definition that everybody bought. There was, as a previous speaker has shared with you, the idea that it's a tool for getting people to do certain things that the communicator wants them to do, calm down or take the shot or whatever. There's the David Spiegel Halter at Cambridge and other people's view of, I think Joe Arvai does this, did, I've uh, been away from the field for a few years, um, no, you just give them the facts. You do not manipulate. I think Baruch Fischoff said it brilliantly in a, in a document that he championed for the FDA. Um, let's face it, we're trying to get people to think towards a certain direction. We're nudging them. At the very least, we're nudging them to use the Thaler and Sunstein phrase. Okay, so what evolved in my mind then was the way to do that best, more effectively than not, not perfectly, is to think of it not as Professor Gigerenzer and Ann Bostrom and other people think of as how do you make the information clear? That's important, certainly important. But my take was how do you present the information in a way that it's going to have maximum impact on what people choose to do? It's ultimately their choice. I'm not trying to manipulate them into take the shot or calm down or whatever. I do have a point of view as a communicator often, the CDC does, public health agencies do, um, but I want my information, whether it's neutral or manipulative, if you wanna call it that, to have maximum impact. And the way to do that in my mind was, and in practice, the people I consulted to worked out this way was, um, you have to factor in both the facts and how people feel. And more than that, you have to demonstrate an understanding of and a respect for how people feel so that what you do is, I think it's the next slide. Here's the definition. Here's my definition, one of many. And the first, I've underlined a few parts. The first very important part is risk communication is in what you do as well as what you say. This is so often overlooked. You can make the numbers as clear as you want, Professor Gigerenzer. But if you do something that damages trust, <laughs> it doesn't matter how clear your numbers are. Doing things matters more to most people than saying things alone. Both matter. So risk communication is how you act, the policies you put into place, et cetera. Um, messages and other interactions that demonstrate in italics, demonstrate, actively um, demonstrate, try to make clear that you're paying attention to an understanding of why people feel the way they do and a respect for that. Instead of treating people as, you know, in the, in the classic deficit model, well, you're just stupid and I'm gonna give you the facts and then we'll fill in that deficit and you'll be less stupid or, um, I know you don't like vaccines, but that word but means I don't care what you feel. Here's what I think you should feel. It's terrible, terrible language for relationship management. And the goal is to build more constructive relationships and build trust. And that gives the communicators work more influence. So if you start there, and I'll get back to the details of how you do that at, at the end of this brief presentation. In my opinion, if that's the, the paradigm you start with, then what you do with the numbers and the facts and all of that are more likely to have more impact, which is whether you're neutral or trying to get people to take the shot, the goal. So now I'm gonna back out 
And this is now going to be a conversation about how hard it is to give people the facts and hope those facts matter. This conversation, and I hope it will be a conversation, I'll ask you a couple of questions, is on the limits on human reason. Um, and it's the, it's, the, it's the study from a bunch of different fields of where that bad comes from. What makes something feel more or less bad? Um, so there are fans of human reason and there are fans of rationality. And I wanna define my terms before we start. So I don't have to read this slide to you, but what's important in these slides is facts, right? Rational, this, this implication that we can be logical, objective, system two, if you know the system one, system two stuff, um, that we could set all our heuristics and biases and, and psychology aside and, and overcome all that and be perfectly fact-based. Well, those are the definitions. And I'll be talking about cognition too, which is what we're all doing at the moment and do subconsciously, any mental process effectively. So here are the fans of reason. I love these quotes and I don't have to, read them all to you, but Plato and Kant and um, Steven Pinker are fans of rationality and reason and the power of the human mind, which it certainly does have to think about things carefully, critically, objectively, rationally, and um, discern the facts by scientific method and all of that. Uh, I will note to you for your entertainment after this talk, you'll get the slides that uh, that um, URL down at the bottom, uh, who's in charge, your mind or your brain. So uh, Professor Pinker and I are kind of friends. When I was a reporter, he seemed to think I was an okay and knowledgeable fellow. And we've stayed in touch and gone to a few ball games together. He's not much of a, he's, he's a fan, but in academia, not he does not connect it to the people who can get the good seats at the ball game <laughs> that I had. So we went to a few ball games and one of them was a hockey game. And he grew up in Montreal and he's a big fan of hockey, big fan of the Montreal Canadiens who are the arch villains in Boston of the Boston Bruins, which is my team because I'm in Boston. So we had a fun night together and I've written about it in here and I'll only summarize it briefly, um, where we went to a Bruins Canadiens game in Boston, but we ran a little experiment at my suggestion, hardly scientific of, you know, an N of two is, pretty weak, um, where we uh, put saliva samples into tubes before the game and after the game. And we measured them. I had a lab uh, work with me for free. It was wonderful. Thank you. Um, to uh, measure the um, testosterone levels in the samples before and after the game. And this is based on the um, evidence that our hormone levels go up and down, particularly aggression hormones or um, yeah, testosterone gets a bad name. It's not just aggression, but aggression too. Um, those levels go up and down depending on whether our tribe, our team is winning or losing. And this happens to men and women. And this happens to participants more even than um, observers. But we were observers. And sure enough, so Stephen and I had a wonderful conversation about, you know, can we be perfectly reasoning? And he says, yes, we can look at history and all of what we've accomplished. You know, uh, his book now is Enlightenment Now. And my argument was, and, and I, again, I'm not a scholar and hardly as learned as he is, but based on what I read, there's a whole lot of stuff in the way of reason. And this subconscious hormone level thing is one of them. And sure enough, the Bruins won four to two and my testosterone level was higher after the game and his was lower. We'd even monitor our beer consumption. So it was equal, you know, tried to erase that confounder. Um, read the story, you'll find it entertaining. It's to the point of what this talk is about. So here, here's the other side. And this is, I have to confess where I come down. Um, and, and I like Pascal's because he has room in it for both, not only by reason, but by the heart, both, but both, not just one. It's really hard to just do the first one. And I'll get to some more science on that in a moment. So 
I like Swift's A Light Rider Easily Shook Off. And this is this is a wonderful. Have, have any of you heard of um, the Devil's Dictionary? You don't have to turn your mics on whenever. I hope you have. It's um, uh, yeah. Beers. Ambrose Bierce was a, a right around the turn of the 20th century cynical writer in uh, San Francisco. This Devil's Dictionary is available online. And by the way, there's a bibliography on this talk at the very end. The last slide is sources. Um, but look at what he calls the brain. <laughs> it's only the organ with which we think we think. I love that. And then if you go on to weigh probabilities on the scales of desire. So when a risk analyst or a Ann Bostrom or Ellen Peters or Ragnar or whomever, risk communicator, gives people numbers, probability numbers. When a doctor gives a patient, you have a one in a hundred or 10% or whatever chance. It goes through all of these emotional filters. That's why I include all of these framing sorts of quotes. So now let me get into the biology. Um, classic fear writer, Stephen King makes a stealthy ruin of the thinking process. So are, are any of you familiar with how, with the work of Joseph Ledoux and how the fear pathways in the physical brain work? Well, I'm certainly not. Okay. V-step sounds like a cool name. I don't know what a V-step is. Okay, or you could just shake your head or whatever. It, it's super critical. And I always include this in my talks because it, it demonstrates how embedded in our neurobi neurobiology, um, the subconscious feelings first, system one thinking, especially with fear works. So here's the anatomy. And this is from Ledoux's uh, book there cited below. So there are a few organs in the brain, a few sections in the brain that matter for the fear pathway. So the outer cortex, which is just really a layer and on top of a lot of brain underneath um, is the wrinkly part we think of as the brain, but there are all these other aspects. And for this um, process, you need to know about the thalamus and the amygdala. So the thalamus is um, many things, but it's the first thing that a stimulus goes. So right now when I'm talking, your auditory system is sending that information to a bunch of places in the brain, but the very first place it gets to is the thalamus. And the thalamus works only like a relay station. It doesn't help you know what the words mean or the sounds mean. It only sends it on to other places, including the auditory cortex and the Wernicke's area and a whole bunch of places. Okay, so that thalamus is the first place stuff goes and it's a relay station. And the amygdala, which you probably all have heard of, is the place where a lot of emotions start. It's highly associated with where fear or what we call the fear uh, response starts. Uh, Ledoux has subsequently modified his language and calls it now anxiety in some cases and fear in other cases. He dances around the semantics. I won't. There are good arguments for the dance. Um, but it's where the, uh-oh, flight or fight fight or flight response starts. So now I wanna ask you this. So there are, are there any poisonous snakes in the Liverpool area? Do you guys know? Not really. Boris okay. Johnson. <laughs> yeah, well, we have our own version of that and a lot of countries do at the moment. Yeah, and slithery and dangerous and deceitful. Um, yes, should have qualified my terms, non-human. Reptile, reptilian, no, okay. But so let's imagine that um, in, in your program, there's a prize for the best paper. And the prize is a free trip to a place that has poisonous snakes. Let's see, you know, it's a, it's a week long, two week long safari in Eastern Africa somewhere, okay? And before you get on the little bus that takes you out to see all the wildlife, they say, just look out for snakes because there's a snake here that's called the uh, black mamba. It's also known as the three-step snake because if it bites you, that's all you have left. 
It's one of the most poisonous snakes in the world. But meanwhile, they're not really around and they'll slither away from you more than bite you and, and really don't worry about it. Okay, so you get out of the bus and you're looking at the lions and you see this on the ground. What do you do? You want to see it again? No, I jumped three feet. I didn't have to see it again. Okay, so Yao Rao is, um, I don't know if you're there with the microphone, you can unmute. Would, what would you do? Not there. Gary, what would you do? I think I'm going to run. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, that's pretty stupid because it's a stick. That's it. And meanwhile, did you look behind you to see if there was a snake? No. <laughs> right. So by not being rational, you could kill yourself. Pretty simple example. Pretty good example. Ledoux has actually, I've given him this picture to use. He's used it in one of his subsequent books. I saw it on a beach in Iceland. I saw it out on the sand. I know there are no sand snakes and any snakes at all in Iceland. Guess what I did? I jumped back too. And then I went, wait, I teach this stuff. <laughs> That's really stupid. Now I'm gonna put it in the grass and take a picture of it because it's a perfect teaching tool. So here's what happens in the brain. And this is why this all matters. So the visual stimulus goes to the thalamus and the thalamus immediately relays it to a number of places. I've only highlighted two, the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, that area in blue, yeah, where we do a lot of higher order decision making. part right behind your forehead. It's considered the um, higher order, rational, critical thinking kind of part of the brain. That's an oversimplification, of course. Okay, notice the length of the yellow lines. So where does the signal get to first? Where we think or where we fear? Look at the biology of how we respond to stimulus. Look at the biology of how our brain has evolved to involved to stimuli. Now, it's true of any stimulus, but I'm picking fear and a snake. It's true of any stimulus. This is the biological process by which the brain handles input. It goes to the place that stimulates what we would call subsequently an emotional response. That's when we finally express our biological response. First. First. So before we've thought about it, we've jumped back as the three of us voted on. So out goes the signal from the amygdala to a bunch of places that do a bunch of basically um, stimulus sorts of things, right? It turns up the glucocorticoids and stress hormones and it narrows our vision and it changes heart pressure and blood flow away from the muscles to the inner core and a whole bunch of things. The fight or flight or freeze response. Then, according to Ledoux, about 23 milliseconds later, the blue line comes in. You, might, you can see it here. I can see if my cursor goes. Um, the blue line comes back from the prefrontal cortex that says, hey, dummy, it's a stick. And the uh, moto, uh, moto, mo motor sensory cortex says, don't jump. And, and your occipital cortex says, I see it. It's only a stick. Meanwhile, these red lines, these jump back lines, if you will, have already started. And I want you in this slide to count up how many blue and how many red. And you don't need the number, but you can see there are more red. So the red are alert signals, are signals from the amygdala to parts of the brain that stimulate a defensive response, a jump back, run, what you do say, Scott, you'd run three feet, whatever, okay? So as Ledoux puts it, Emotions have an edge over rationality. And this is not just at first. Let me let you read this quote first. But the point is, the, and I put it in italics, the connections from the emotional systems to the cognitive systems, the feeling systems, whatever you want to call it, very loose language here, um, they're stronger. There are more of them. They're more powerful because of the kinds of things that they trigger in the brain. So 
This isn't just at first. So that's the at first. Notice the blue line hasn't come back in yet. But even over time, as I'm thinking about nuclear power versus natural gas for dealing with the Russian energy crisis, as I'm thinking about do I vaccinate or not, the red lines here, the emotional, the affective nature of it has a louder voice in the biology of our brain. Well, if you don't take that into account when you're doing risk communication, you will not be as successful. It just seems inescapable to me. All right, so let me move on. And I, I mentioned this already that when I, I'm, a, I'm a very big believer in, the, in how biologically determined our behaviors are. It's not as though we can't, with our thinking critical mind, shape those behaviors. Of course we can. But the initial responses, as I've shown you, are uh, pre-cognitive, as Lang a long time ago, um, uh, James um, and Lang pointed out. So I love this. This was a great quote from Charles Darwin. So Charles Darwin is ostensibly a pretty good critical thinker, yeah? <laughs> So he says in the book about the faces of man, the, the commonality that he saw about the expressions of people, I think it's on page 39. He talks about going to the London Zoo and putting his nose up to an exhibit of a puff adder, I think it was, and the, and the snake struck at him. He didn't like being stared at or whatever. And, um, and he jumped back like we all would from the stick, right? And then he said to himself, he, he writes about this, that was stupid. <laughs> I'm going to go back and learn not to do that. So he literally would go back to the zoo, or I think it was the London Zoo, and provoke the snake into striking at him. And he could not undo, with reason, <laughs> the instinctive keep me alive system that was first and more powerful. It's just a brilliant encapsulation of this whole biology thing. Now, here's another bit of science. Have any of you read this book? Or are you familiar with this Descartes error? I highly, highly, highly commend it. It was recommended to me by Paul Slovit, who is a very, very wonderful human being and a graceful man allowing a non-scholar like me to synthesize his and Baruch Fischoff's and others' work uh, to try to bring it to greater common attention, public attention, as my writing has, and speaking has done, attempted to do. So uh, Antonio Damasio was at the University of Iowa at the time, and this guy Elliot comes to him, and his life is in tatters. He's been divorced a couple times. His kids had disowned him. He's living in his car. He's, his savings are gone. He had been a successful insurance salesman with a house in the suburbs, the whole success story. His life is now what we would call a total ruin. And they did all sorts of cognitive testing on it. And he was brilliant. Whoa, memory tests and you know, analogy tests and all the Mensa stuff. He was pretty close to genius level on those tests. But it turns out that Elliot couldn't make a single choice, a single choice. I mean, a red or blue tie, nine or 10 o'clock for an appointment to the dentist. I mean, really minimal stuff. And now let's get more complicated. How do I treat that person because of the color of their skin or their gender? How do I respond to a job offer? How do I work as a social being? He couldn't choose. And here's why. So he had had a, an operation that had severed the connection from these parts of the brain, which are loosely thought of as where emotions and memory and a bunch of things come from, okay? And the cognitive, I'm sorry, the critical thinking part of the brain. So right in here, he had had an operation because he had been, been having life-threatening seizures. So the operation severed the connection between the emotional part and the thinking part of his brain. So while this part was brilliant, it couldn't talk to this part. So all the facts that Gerd Gigerenzer and Ann Bostrom and Steve Wallison and brilliant, brilliant, brilliant um, uh, risk communicators make clear to people got in here, but they had no emotional valence because they couldn't talk to the feelings part of his brain. They were just dead. 
And Nietzsche, who another relatively thoughtful fellow, whether you like his ideas or not, there are no facts. There are only interpretations. We talk these days about alternative facts and false news, and that's been bastardized into the Boris Johnson, Trump world of politics. But in fact, listen to me use the word fact, Everything that we take in as subjective perceivers of the world goes through the conversation between these two parts of the brain to give the data, raw, cold numbers or information, emotional valence, without which Elliot was a dysfunctional human being. You need to be able to layer that on to what you think about nuclear power or vaccines or whatever. So now we slide into fields that I'm sure you're probably familiar with. So the polymath Herbert Simon described the condition that we live in as bounded rationality. I had this conversation with Stephen and he, he acknowledges, Pinker, and he acknowledges all these points. And then he goes, yeah, but look at what the enlightenment gave us, which is true. It's not either or. It's like we're reasoning and feeling. So Simon put it wonderfully. Bounded rationality is the idea, for those of you unfamiliar, that our ability to be perfectly cognitively objective is bounded by, and he only named three conditions, actually. Uh, I'd be more inclusive. Um, we don't have all the time to get all the facts. We don't have all the expertise to understand all the facts. Sometimes we just don't have all the facts. COVID hits and we don't know about how it communicates, and how it spreads, et cetera. But we have to make a decision about whether to cross the street or to put on a mask or take a vaccine. So our rationality is bounded by those conditions. I would add that it's bounded by all of the biology of how we instinctively, subjectively respond to stimuli. So then we move on to dual process theory and the system one, system two world is generally credited, commonly publicly credited, dually to Kahneman and Tversky and others. But I always mention Keith Stanovich and Richard West because they came up with it first. I mean, this dual process idea of system one and system two. But it's a whole body of evidence that Kahneman wonderfully and others have wonderfully popularized with heuristics and biases. And you're familiar with those literatures. And I, I needn't go into all the details except to point out that the whole point of his having won the Nobel Prize in Economics, and Richard Thaler, by the way, who co-authored the book Nudge with Cass Sunstein a few years later, which is kind of based on this stuff, he won the Nobel Gold Prize, not the Gold Prize in Economics, which is given by the Nobel Committee, uh, both of them, for putting to rest, hopefully, the idea of homo economicus, this University of Chicago school of thinking that we're purely rational and $2 is twice the value of one. No, we use all these heuristics and biases to actually make the judgments that we make using the quick instinctive system one that doesn't think things through and comes to quick judgments or the more time consuming, calorie consuming, effortful uh, system two. And we use both, but we tend to defer to system one. And there's an interesting thing, and I, I noted in um, Kahneman's um, literature, um, I was never aware of this. this. This is really, really important to me in, in my thinking. So the brain is the most calorie hungry part of the body. It uses, right now, it's using 25% of your calories. And if you were running down the street, it still would be. On a daily basis, the brain consumes way more calories than any other part of your body. Calories are energy. Calories are sugar, very crudely, of course, right? Now, think about when we're evolving. These processes are developing. The brain is developing in an environment that doesn't have a lot of convenience stores in every corner or a cafeteria in the lab where you work or where we don't know whether, not what we're going to eat next, whether we're going to eat next. So it saves calories by using system one. They're shortcuts. And Kahneman himself observed this. It wasn't like I thought it up. And, you know, he's, he's got these studies about the, uh, there's this famous study about the, um, the Israeli judges who had to decide whether somebody would be recommended for parole or not. 
And during the first part of the morning, they had a higher rate of saying yes, which required them to read the entire file. And as the morning wore on, they more automatically, quickly, without reading the whole file, said no. Then they'd have lunch, <laughs> load up on some calories. And the same thing happened in the early afternoon. They read the file more carefully and refer more people to possible parole. And in the afternoon, when they needed an extra candy bar, a cup of coffee, no. So this system one, system two stuff is really deeply wired into who we are biologically. Then there are other ideas that I want to just touch on very quickly. There's the idea of motivated reasoning. Um, you know, we think about things so that our view comes out to what we want it to come out to. Um, the Mercer, Mercier and Sperber idea that we developed cognition and the ability to think rationally to win arguments because that helped us survive compared to the people who lost them. So-called argumentative theory. And Dan Kahan's wonderful work um, based on um, Aaron Woldovsky and Mary Douglas's foundational stuff um, that we see the world through the lenses of our general sense of how society should work. So there are individualists who think society should leave individuals alone. They think Brexit, let's get out of EU. And there are people who are communitarian on the other end of that continuum who think, no, we're all in it together. Being in all in it together is better. And there are people who are, uh, what do you call them, hierarchical, who like um, the seven chains of heaven from God down to the king and so forth, and order in society, pattern, pattern, uh, rigid pattern. That has to do with patriarchy, that has to do with wealth and class, no small things in England and anywhere in the world. And down on the bottom are, um, what do you call them? Not communitarians, egalitarians, who don't like all the bounds of those limits. And those are basic ideas of how society should operate. And it turns out that if you ask people six or seven, he asks six or seven questions of people to put them in these categories, somewhere on this continuum. And it lines up almost perfectly with what they think about a whole bunch of common issues, not just political issues, but issues about energy and church and a whole bunch of stuff. So there are all these patterns that um, develop out of that biology I've been talking about. There's also this, and I won't spend much time on it, but it, it's powerfully informative to me, uh, moral foundations theory. And I've put this link here. It's a summary for regular folks like me of what moral foundations theory has found and who's found it. And you can see under that first paragraph, there's care, harm, fairness, cheating. These two are codes that we have um, where it appears that some of them may be born in and nature and nurture both um, about how society should operate. So if somebody challenges your uh, country's flag, like uh, an American footballer took a knee during um, some football games. Um, the people who were more on the authority side of that authority slash one, uh, they were more offended than the people on the other side of that slash because of their underlying morality. And the important point is to move on quickly. This happens automatically, instant this is system one stuff. This precedes, remember all those lines in the brain? This precedes rational thinking. And by preceding it, as Kahneman and others' work has shown, it frames then how we process the critical thinking that follows. The stress hormones in our system make us more, more uh, sensitive to other threats. Even when we slow down and think about, well, COVID, but there's B2 now, and do I get sick or not from this one, and am I vaccinated? The stress of how we reacted to COVID at first is informing that rational thinking. So then there's the whole literature that really got me started in this, which is Paul's and Baruch's, and, and um, as I say, Paul, among the whole field, has been the most gracious in supporting my efforts to proselytize the knowledge that he and the others have developed. And you're probably familiar with the list, and it, it's the subject of my second book where I tried for the general world to summarize the things that make some risks scarier than others, generally, for most 
people and most risks over time. We're more afraid when we don't feel a sense of control, which in my opinion has a lot to do with the Brexits and the immigration and all of that. The people who wanted out of that, not only are they more individualist or hierarchical to Khan, but those are people who are losing out in globalization. And that means they don't feel as much control over their lives. This is my interpretation of all of that. There's, if there's literature on it, I'm not learned enough to have read it. So we're more afraid of risks when we don't have a sense of control and less afraid when we do have control, like driving down the road and using our mobile phone, even though we know we're not supposed to because we tell ourselves, yeah, but I'll slow down and I'm a good driver. That's the game of this risk perception. We're more afraid of human-made risks, GMOs, than natural risks, which is the natural way of creating hybrids, which is pretty much everything we eat. Yeah, so you're familiar with that literature. Climate change is a really important example and it gets to the risk communication issue in my mind because um, when I would give talks and I would always ask audiences this and I, I can't ask you guys because you're not on camera and only four of us. Um, can you name, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you three to think about this or the people watching this tape. Can you name one way, any way, I don't need to know the details of it, but can you name one way, think of one way that climate change is going to seriously threaten your health in the next 10 years? Now, if you're down where it's 104 degrees or 39 Celsius, maybe you say yes, but most people can't. Can you, KR? Name me one way. Can you feel one way that you feel personally threatened in the next 10 years by climate change? I am, I am suffering from the heat today at the moment. That's just, no, 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 that's hot out. That's, that's a hot out. That's not gonna kill you heat. Down yeah. south, it might be. Do you feel threatened to that level by anything in climate change in the next 10 years? Um, yeah. Yeah? No, no. Most, Ardent believers, believers in climate change, of course, we believe in climate change, You're, you know, people who don't believe in climate change in this country, particularly, don't believe in evolution either. So let's set that rationality or irrationality aside. I, I have a fear that I won't be able to sell my house in Florida. after. All right. All right. So that's tangible. Because it's, it's two feet above sea level. That's the problem. So. Yeah, but, but that's, see, that's not God, health. That, but that's real and that's personal. And this is exactly my point. Thank you for adding that. So you have one, but most of us don't. And so climate change, a survey just came out in the United States that said that 1% of Americans call it a voting issue of any kind. Because when um, the Yale Center for Climate, uh, climate change, Yale Center for Climate Study, um, Joe, Joe Lezerwitz's group, does surveys on uh, people's opinion about climate change. Uh, fortunately, and I was one of several people who encouraged them to do this let, several years ago, several iterations of this study ago, they added a couple questions. And they added questions about, you know, how seriously do you take it? And are you ready to make changes in your life? And um, is it a voting issue and all that? And the numbers have been going up very encouragingly. And they always come out with a new poll and say, look, the numbers are going up. And then there's a couple questions at the end that says, that ask, do you think it's gonna to happen to you or your family? And it's always the lowest yes response. It's always less than half, way less than half. And it's not changing much. We don't own polar bears. Most of us don't have the homes on the coast. Most of us, um, let me be careful about this. In the developed world, with reasonable economic resources, feel we have a sense of control over the kinds of things we need to do to cool off. You're probably in air conditioned buildings. Um, climate change doesn't have some of the risk perception psychological factors that trigger the deep concern that would trigger sufficient public pressure to get the governments to finally do all of what they have to do. Uh, so enough of that particular slide, final definitions. And then just a bit about risk communication, then be done. Um, Oxford English Dictionary, there's that word facts. 
And there's that word fact, true. What's true? What's true? Boris Johnson it was a good prime minister, true or false. <laughs> there is no true. There are things that science can definitely prove. I'll use that word. But then we interpret what that science tells us through all of these lenses that I've just gone through. So that makes risk communication a wicked problem. And a wicked problem is the core of the definition in my mind is you can't completely solve it. Climate change is a wicked problem. Any big component of climate change, the energy system is a wicked problem. You can make improvements, must make improvements. You can't make it perfect. And then I close with this. And I, I love this. And Stephen, God bless him for his open mindedness to a schmo like me, loved this quote when I shared it with him from Avignano. Reason itself is fallible. And that fallibility must find a way into our logic. That's the risk management and risk communication application of the sciences that I just went through. That's logically using what we know about system one, system two, and moral reasoning and bounded rationality to do our actions and words and messages and other interactions in ways that are likely to have the most effect. Now, I'm not going to read the slide. I put it in here so that you can have it. This is how I, just one person, actualize all of what I just said. So this risk relationship management approach, that's the start. You would have this chart that I put the, no, I didn't put the second one in. You would have this chart as a guide, and then you'd have a bunch of pages that are blank for your particular risk issue to plan out a risk communication program in advance. Most of them are reactive and that's really dumb. You're already, you've already damaged trust. People are already afraid. The amygdalas have gone off. You should always do this in advance as a part of risk management. Governments are really poor at, an, at planning risk communication. Anything more than creating the channel for the radio button that lets everybody hear the message. So you would have this chart and you would have, these columns would be blank and you can make them bigger or smaller. It's not the physical layout on the page that matters. These are, these are thinking columns, ideas columns. In the upper right corner above them, however, you would have the goal. What's your goal? Because if you don't set that first and then use it to inform all your choices, you're less likely to accomplish what you want to. So your goal is to get people to be vaccinated. Your goal is to encourage people to consider nuclear as a clean source of energy. Your goal is to encourage people to look at the science of GMOs, which tells us over 30 years now that there's no evidence that anybody's been able to find that there's a human health risk to the GMOs that are in our food supply. Um, whatever your goal is, you have to start before you fill in all the rest of this chart with what do you want to accomplish? And then underneath the goal, and I, I forgive me for not putting this second chart up, on a blank sheet with these columns, you put the time and date because it's dynamic. COVID, <laughs> perfect teaching example, right? New variants, uh, political statements by leaders, um, a ton of things change. So a risk relationship management program needs to have a senior executive, a C-level person responsible for it. And below him or her, people who are looking at, you know, what the social media says and the news media and the, 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 the scientific um, developments are Omicron developed in, in um, was first detected in South Africa. Um, all of the dynamics. So you fill in a new page because it's going to change the circumstances and context. It might trigger different risk perception factors. As soon as Trump started talking about, you know, freedom of choice stuff, wow, control leapt to the top of the chart for a whole bunch of people, right? And control is a really important one for um, um, 
a vaccination in general, vaccine resistance and vaccine refusal. You know, there's 25% of Americans are hesitant about vaccines, but only about 5% don't vaccinate, mostly their children. So that's, I, I just wanted to give you a brief introduction to that chart. And then the last slide is that, and I'll stop sharing my screen, stop share. And we can, if we want to discuss all of that. That's me. How did I? Oh my God, it's an hour. Jesus. I'm, I'm here. So however long you like. And if you're all air conditioned, you're probably going to stay inside, but whatever you like. Sorry. Thank you very much, David, for a very insightful talk. Um, yeah, I think we do have some time for uh, Q&A. Um, okay. I've got an Alex uh, hand up. So do you want to unmute yourself and ask questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks very, very much for the talk. Uh, I, my apologies. I was I was looking forward to this, and I actually only came in about halfway through. So oh, it's on tape. But uh, yeah, it's it's recorded, thankfully. So I'll catch up on that. Um, it's on digits. I'm sorry, I'm I'm, I'm dating myself. It's on digits. <laughs> yeah, I've got my uh, my VHS going, so <laughs> it'll all be sorted. Uh, my question kind of relates to um, in the aspect of trust i think it's been something we've been talking about a lot when you're doing some kind of risk communication ultimately you are trying to influence someone to your way of thinking uh, or in in that that would be my view there may be people out there who believe that it can be possible to communicate risk in such a way as to inform people and they can make their own decisions but i i, I don't know what your opinion on the ability for people to as i said at the beginning i'm as i said at the beginning i'm of the opinion that it depends on the issue so sometimes just plain facts will help sometimes you want to encourage people to vaccinate mm. but do you think in general risk communication will be aided by transparency over the aims of the communication or like what what impact do you think that would have on the transparency is a pretty transparency is a pretty word um the legitimacy of trust is sensed by all of us about everything all the time not just risk but particularly when we're in danger we are exquisitely and there's deep neurobiology on this as well sensitive to all sorts of signals that say we can trust that person or not. And now let me define trust based on my understanding of evolutionary psychology and neurobiology. And again, I'm not a scholar, but I'm just fairly well read on this stuff. Trust is basically a measure of, are you on my side? I mean, if you think about it in evolutionary terms, when the lion is attacking, if you and I, Alexander, are together and trust each other and fight off the lion, one of us may make it. And if we're all, all six or seven of us trusting of each other and fight off the lion together, one or two of us might make it, right? But if, Alexander, you just said something that made me think you're not on my side, <laughs> dude, you're lion chow, right? So I yeah. think of trust as who's on my side. Now that can come from openness and transparency, as long as that's legitimate. Don't hide something and then say you're transparent, but don't just do transparency as a show, because if you do transparency as a show and you screw up on a whole bunch of other signals, like put your mask on, that's not showing an understanding of and respect for the way people are feeling. You blow trust that way. We're exquisitely sensitive to who's on our side, who's on our political side. We, we do this with tribe a lot, of course. That's a common thing these days, right? So Brexit's a common one and Johnson there and, you know, lots of politics, right? But our tribes include, you know, what silo are we in academically? <laughs> uh, gender, age, I'm a Liverpool fan, I'm a Man U fan. Uh, boy, there are tons of tribes, right? Um, we, and, and this, is a, this is a theory that I would like to share with you all to think about. We demonstrate loyalty to our tribe by maintaining their beliefs. The German Greens are willing to live with more coal plants to replace the power than they are to turn nuclear power plants back on. How stupid is that based on the data alone? But it's the tribal belief that got the Green Party started to be anti-nuclear. 
So if you say you're now pro-nuclear, you get kicked out of that tribe. Now, how does that feel to the animal that needs the tribe's protection when the lion attacks? So in the United States, we had people who had relatives dying of COVID who still refused to wear the mask because that was a tribal belief. The loyalty to the tribe is so powerfully protective that it transcended their data about the risk from the damn disease that was killing their mothers and fathers. The trust thing, who's on my side, imbues an awful lot of our behavior and transparency, honest transparency is one way to demonstrate it. And to the point where even if you're honest about what you don't know, some people will say as risk communicators, you shouldn't admit what you don't know. I'm of the belief as many others are that of course you should be because that honesty shows that you're not trying to fool people and therefore you will be more trusted. Very long answer. No, that's a, that's a very uh, interesting answer. Yeah, lots of things. I think there's there's a lot. Obviously, it it goes into all like Kahneman and and all that. But the the fact that social kind of cognition of risk is a big reason. Uh, well, is a big factor in why human logic doesn't necessarily apply to like reason in air quotes because it's actually like it's the humans humans trying to maneuver through this incredibly complex social system that is very unpredictable but we've got these factors that help us work through that but then you end up with trust issues and, and such well, it, if, if, if you think about it alexander what what's the basic job that you and i have that our biology has when we wake up before we've shaken off our unconsciousness even what's the job what's been our biology's job overnight to keep us alive. Mm. We're survival machines, principally. We can think about that to help survive. Yay, that's an awesome additional power. But it's additional. And it's layered on top of what mostly we've used till now, till things got more complicated. So I'm, I'm very much of the opinion. Do any of you know the work of uh, Robert Sapolsky, S-A-P-O-L-S-K-Y? I highly, highly, highly commend two books by him, an earlier one called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And the short answer is they get stressed when the lion's attacking and then they either get eaten or away and they don't stay stressed, we stay stressed. And the systems that change when we're stressed aren't supposed to stay changed for more than a couple of weeks. And when they do, higher blood pressure, et cetera, it's really bad for our health, including our digestive system. And it contributes to, exacerbates the risk of ulcers, which are ultimately bacterial. But the second one is, um, oh God, it's, it's more recent and it's a tome. Uh, it's not fast reading, but it's entertaining reading. His voice is very um, entertaining. Um, hu human nature, the best and worst of us, something like that. It's powerfully, to me, persuasive that a lot of our behaviors are the post hoc reaction to what stimuli have set the survival machine doing in the first case. So I commend that as a piece of reading too. Thank you very much. Yeah. By the way, Alexander, Liverpool, Chelsea, Man City, I, I actually, I get this question all the time. I have no idea about football. I, I would defer to Liverpool. Well, I don't know. If my granddad's near, I'd say Man United. If my godfather's here, I'd say Liverpool. So it depends who's in the room. Yeah, there you go. But you see the tribalism. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Everybody knows it's Everton. Well, you know, they're a fun team too. <laughs> or at least they have been in the past at times. How's that? So, so I, I didn't realize you were friends with Steven Pinker. That is very yeah, exciting. Casual, very casual. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's very exciting to me because um, I believe that his, you know, I attribute it to him, maybe it predates him, but this idea that the human brain is multi-cameral, that we have these little processors that are solving individual problems, one of which is, you know, assessing fairness in peer interactions. And, and I'm sure there's one for, that's even deeper at tribal membership calculations. But there's, you know, the famous one for him is the language processor. Right, of course, that's where he started. That's right. where he started. Um, but there's also the ambiguity 
detector, yeah. uh, which, which is in that amygdala, right? And then the some of it is. Yes. Some of it is, yeah. So I've long thought that um, some of the confusion we have in well, even in risk analysis, you know, before communication, some of the confusion we have is due to misappreciation for the nature of the uncertainty. Some of it's fear and it's just uncertainty. And other of others, bits of it are assessing, assessed by the probability sense, you know, that um, Blimsher works on. That seems to have very little to do with the, amb the ambiguity detector. That's right. So it, d doesn't it seem reasonable to you that, of course, it's going to ring right, right at this moment. Uh, let me cancel that. Um, doesn't it seem to you that, well, for instance, the that you know two dimensional picture that Paul Slovic has of the dread risk and the you know the the two the yeah the PCA the the principal components analysis of risks I think that can be explained by the existence of two of Pinker's modules working at the same time. Does that make sense to you? That involves all your friend group. I, I think it makes sense. I think it's more complicated than that and. Sure. Um, we're only on the very first days of understanding the complications of what goes on up in here. They just, dis they just discovered that axon, individual axons can do calculations before they decide whether and how loudly to send the next message down a dendrite. Oh my God, the stuff we're discovering about our brain. Um, as there are Wernicke's area and the other one I forget for language, there are specific areas of the brain that with fMRI and other technologies, PET, have been identified as lighting up or probably central to the functioning of certain functions. The occipital lobe was the first work where that was done, where there were cells that saw this line and cells, different cells that saw that line. Oh my God. And we could probably tease all that apart. But let me get a little bit more uh, reductionist. And I've made this case with Stephen too. I stumbled across in my reading about the amygdala for my second book, the fact that so the, the amygdala, this little almond shape has, uh, it actually has cells that respond to what the th thalamus says, and then it sends it to another side that tells the brain what to do. It's actually quite, um, it's more detailed. It's not um, universal, uh, homogenous. And the cells that receive it side literally have cells that are, we, we, you've talked about oxytocin. I know you've heard it in your previous lectures. It literally has cells that when oxytocin binds to them, it turns off our sensitivity to mistrust. There's a biological root right. to what the role of oxytocin in the, in the trust mechanism. And oxytocin gets more and less credit than it should, and it's a complicated conversation. But in terms of trust, they literally have done the experiment Well, they'll dose those receiver side amygdala cells in oxytocin and our mistrust goes down. So is that one area of the brain that does trust though? I think to your question, Scott, I think that's too simple. Um, it certainly suggests there are modules as you put it in there that play critical roles. Um, but I, I, from my limited knowledge, it seems like it's a way more complicated mess up there than this place does that and this place does that. Oh yeah, sure. But um, I, I wasn't even thinking of the localities, but the, the functionality of those. Oh, okay. Things. Okay. But, but, but as to trust, I, I've long feared that Carl Rowe will be weaponizing oxytocin, <laughs> just sprinkling it in the, in the house chamber, for instance, might be... <laughs> experiment they're working on well you, you know about the you know about the experiments the swiss did with the money no you no. guys know this one this is amazing uh, i forget who did it uh, my memory is going to be vague on this um basically they had a bunch of experimental subjects come in and they gave them each 10 francs i think it was in swiss money right and they said you can keep it and you can go or you can stay with a chance to double it and here's how that chance will work before you decide. We can, um, let's see, they gave, oh, no, no, no. At that point, it's, at some point uh, early on, they sprayed half of them with oxytocin and half not. So you had two experimental groups. Yeah. Okay. So now they're asking him, do you want to do this gamble? 
we can we will give your money your 10 francs to somebody else an investor might be a person might be a computer you will never know and that investor can do one of two things double it and split the difference with you so he makes another 10 and gives you five and you leave with 15 instead of 10 cool or the investor can take your 10 thank you very much and do whatever the hell he wants with it so there's a trust question yeah yeah and the people with this oxytocin spray all uh, much more uh, said ah let's go with the investor right so now we're talking oxytocin on the amygdala everything right but this was the second part brilliant part of the experiment they burned half of the people who decided to invest so half the people who decided yeah give the money to the investor they said ah sorry you lose <laughs> your 10 francs is gone and then they said you want to try again <laughs> you want to try again suckers yeah they did right and guess what the oxytocin turned the people who were burned talk about rational evidence into suckers a second time brilliant experiment uh, but we're, we're on a diversion um it all speaks to me and alex is what my talk was about and you'll see the first half too um boy we're driven by this stuff a lot more than the fancy thinkers would like to think we are sure yeah, I, th I think crypto and NFTs have been a very oh interesting, a very interesting oh. demonstration of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and the tribes of that people think of about the unique kinds of people to which to, to whom that appeals, mm. right? And there's a whole. So if I'm if I'm thinking of marketing crypto, I'm thinking the same language, and of course marketers do, and of course you know car showrooms would spray oxytocin to everybody who walked in. They're aware of all of this stuff, and yeah, it's, it's powerfully relevant. So it does, it's, it's essentially a very pessimistic realization that we have, right? I mean, tribal affiliation, uh, if, if that's really what's governing us, then we really don't have any hope for, you know, the 2024. Ah, but, but you see, this is where I kept saying, yeah, but we can be reasoning too. And uh, Abignano's quote that says our, our rationality is fallible, but we can understand that and use that understanding in how we do stuff. So, for example, in risk communication, to bring it all the way back to our subject, it's now more and more understood that you don't step on tribal toes when you're trying to communicate with someone. Yeah, that's that's a big lesson, obviously. Right. I mean, it's, you know, hello, duh, right? It's like around the Thanksgiving table in the United States, you avoid politics and religion. Same thing, right? Or, or you appeal to tribal toes. So in the United States, there's a community in the middle of the country that's full of people who don't believe in climate change. And the head of the town wanted to do some green things, solar panels on town hall and stuff. And he specifically avoided saying it's for climate change. And he specifically mentioned that it's to save us money so we can shrink the size of government. Brilliant, <laughs> right? Right? So it's not as though the tribal differentiations are in and of themselves barriers, they're tools. Yeah. There was a risk communication program with the vaccination in a very progressive Australia, uh, Australian community. And um, they realized you needed to appeal. To, they, they had this respect for people's tribal identities and their other subjective fears and so forth. So they, the, the program was, um, they had a bunch of very environmentalist looking type people on billboards and in PSAs and so forth saying, look, I use cloth nappies and I recycle and I vaccinated my kid. So, you know, think about it or something neutral like that. But look, I'm of your tribe. And the study of the results found that one third of the people who were vaccine hesitant, not the absolute refusers, were persuaded to vaccinate their kids as a result of this campaign. Yeah. And one third didn't change their view. And one third, to get to your question about Al uh, Alex, your question about trust, said, you're trying to jerk me around and got more resistance. 
Boyd, yeah, boy, does that sound familiar. <laughs> right. So, you know, there are lots of other things, like at the very beginning of my talk, Alexander, uh, Alex, I talked about how risk communication is what you do more than just what you say. And control is a very important variable for how afraid people are. I mean, if you're driving your car is one thing. If you're sitting in the passenger seat, you feel differently, right? So in Europe, there are all of these uh, community what are expert panels you have names for them i forget the name but you have all of these things where people in the community volunteer to represent their community and study up on the issue for a year and become experts on behalf of the community so they can recommend to the community um, what happens but it's basically sharing control of the decision making and policy making process and those things can work can work depends on the issue because you're sharing you're putting people's hands on the steering wheel. Um, so there are lots of ways, I think, Scott, that the, that the tribe thing um, can help. Uh, but like I said, it's a wicked problem, and I don't think it can solve. But it can be used to help, I think. Can you, um, that uh, Italian philosopher, the Abagnano, uh, reason itself is fallible, and that fallibility must find a way into our logic. What does find a way into our logic mean? So well, what I, what I take it to mean is, you know, we know about system one and system two. Now let's develop nudges so that we can use it. It's behavioral economics, if you will. Ah, okay, nice. You know, right? It's like we know how people. We know that people's thinking is not just fact based, and we know what triggers make it happen the way it happens. Let's use that knowledge as tools. That's how I take it. Yeah, I see. Thanks. Okay, um, do we have any other questions or comments that we would like to make before we finish the session? Please keep them coming by email if you choose. We're in contact. I am engaged by this stuff, even though I no longer make my living by it. Although, <laughs> let me do this very quickly, and this is not promotional, but a lot of what my work has been in the last several years is identifying examples of what I call the risk perception gap. Have any of you heard that phrase? No. I tried to coin it so it caught on, but I'm nobody, so it didn't. Um, Paul has used it a couple of times, but it didn't. What I mean by that is when our fears don't match the facts and the gap gets us into trouble, uh. right? When we drive drunk because we think we're in control or use the phone when we drive. When we fear nuclear power so much that we go to coal instead when we don't vaccinate because my sense of uh, individuality is offended and we die of COVID. A risk perception gap is not only where we worry more or less than the evidence suggests is optimal, but the mistake harms us, creates a risk. It's almost, it's almost like uh, the social amplification of risk, you know, where there's secondary and tertiary risks from how we communicate. Um, I have a book that is uh, under review has been accepted and is being reviewed by uh, Johns Hopkins University Press coming out next year called Rethinking Our Fear of Cancer, in which I argue that there is probably no greater example, more profound example, maybe climate change is more profound in the long term. There's no more immediate profound example of a risk perception gap than our sometimes excessive fear of cancer. There are many cancers that research has confirmed now will never harm us. Prostate, some prostate cancers for men, some breast cancers for women, most thyroid cancers. And yet now that we screen for everything and find everything, when you hear that you have C word cancer, you have surgeries that do harm that the disease never itself would have. Uh, we spend inordinately more as, as in developed countries, as, as societies, regulating the risk of environmental carcinogens, which are a risk attributable to very controversially up to as much as 20% of cancers causing the cancer, not exacerbating, causing the asbestos and benzene, right? But we spend way more on that than we do regulating particulate air pollution, which kills tens of thousands more people a year because cancer. 
The book is full of examples of the risk perception gap of our sometimes excessive fear of the disease that we fear most, even though it's never been the greatest killer. So I want to leave you with that as a thought example of how risk communication, like my book, hopefully, can begin to address in a trustworthy way the gap and narrow the gap and reduce the harm. Sorry, long postscript. Oh, no, that's great. And thank you very much. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, we have to close the session now. Um, but uh, thank you so much again for uh, your insightful talk. And thank you, everyone, for uh, the contribution to discussions. Um, so, as I said, uh, we'll be back uh, in September now. Um, so I uh, wish you um, all a very lovely summer. Please don't uh, melt down with the heat. And I'll see you soon. Thank you very and much. I hope the that. sky stays clear and you get to see the aurora. I'm jealous. Uh, <laughs> thanks so much, David. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, David. Thank you, everyone. Okay. See you okay. soon. Bye-bye. Have a good one. Bye.